<laughs> this will be uh, a little bit of just the intro to the course today, so we won't get too exciting. But so when I first designed this course, uh, I think I only had like 13 students in it, so it was a much more kind of seminar-focused course. Uh, so I've had to seeing the enrollment had to shift things a bit. So um, if you download the, the original syllabus that I had attached to the course when it was being advertised, has changed a little bit. Uh, the topics are still the same, but how we're going to kind of run things is gonna be a little bit different. So uh, there may be less open-ended uh, kind of assignments, um, discussions. Uh, I still wanna do discussions on say a couple of readings and things like that in the course, but we'll just have to kind of play it by ear about how things are organized because we're not gonna be able to just kind of get in a circle and discuss a paper. Uh, but uh, so this course is uh, now, it, it used to have a slightly different title, but for marketing purposes, I was asked to change the title to Bio-Inspired AI and Optimization. <laughs> What's um, the actual name? Well, they, well, so for marketing purposes, I was originally asked to, uh, the first time I taught it, that it was supposed to be like uh, distributed methods and decision making. Oh. And, um, and then I changed it to Bio-Inspired AI and Optimization. Both, I think, uh, are accurate. Uh, but so I, it, there's kind of an uh, ISO curve of, of uh, fitness for these, the title of the, these courses. So, but, the, but the basic idea here is that we're gonna survey some algorithms that I'm hoping that most of you have heard of, some of you might know a lot about, but hopefully that even though you might know a lot about some, you may not have a lot of background in the others. And so you maybe have heard about, say, a genetic algorithm, maybe you've um, used genetic algorithms in some tools that you use, uh, you know, maybe in a drop-down box somewhere, you ran some code where you gave it an optimization <coughs> objective, and you let the thing ran, and it came back with an answer, uh, but maybe you don't know what's going on under the surface of that, and uh, maybe you don't um, really understand the strengths and weaknesses of these, and when you might anticipate when, say, a genetic algorithm would do well uh, or not do well for certain types of problems. And so uh, the algorithms that we're going to be talking about in this course are going to be nature-inspired. So most of these cases will be biologically inspired. There's a few that are more physically inspired. Uh, and we'll be uh, talking about why you would possibly use such algorithms as opposed to ones that um, kind of just come out of people's own heads without um, without sort of any insight into, uh, in, you know, are there analogous processes that work this way? So, and then I'm also going to try to give you, because I have a mixed background, it's kind of in engineering, but it's also in biology, and so what we'll find is that a lot of these, these nature-inspired algorithms are actually simplified models of real phenomena that we see in either biological systems or other natural systems. And when you actually study those real phenomena, you find there are certain traps for those models in the real cases. And we will sort of talk about uh, whether we need to worry about those traps in our engineered cases and what we can learn about those traps and when we don't have to worry about those. And so, um, for example, those of you who use a genetic algorithm, you might not be familiar with something called genetic drift. Or at least if you are uh, familiar with it, you might have heard that term, but you don't really know maybe the insights underneath what, what does we mean by drift. And it turns out this, this thing, genetic drift, which is something that comes up in undergraduate biology is, and population genetics, is really, really important for, uh, to keep in mind when you're crafting a genetic algorithm or an algorithm that looks like a genetic algorithm. And I, I use the genetic algorithms often as a conceptual kind of uh, uh, touch point uh, because so many of these crazy meta heuristics are isomorphic to genetic algorithms. So with you relabel things and it turns out that even though they thought it was inspired by jazz musicians, in reality, it's actually just a genetic algorithm with a different labeling. So um, turns out that the, the GA that, is, that we hear about a lot has, ends up being reinvented over time uh, by people that are trying to make some variations, but in the end, I think, just end up just creating their own special versions. So what prereqs? Uh, we're gonna see maybe a little bit of calculus in the course, not that much. Basically, just have an awareness of you know, differentiation and integration. Uh, you're also gonna be asked to do a little bit of computer programming in your language of choice. 
So be it MATLAB or Python, Java, NetLogo, Excel, whatever. Uh, but basically, as we go through some of these different algorithms, I'll ask you to implement sort of small versions of them from scratch as opposed to just leaning on some API that the software package is giving you. So you have a better idea of what's, what's going on behind the scenes. Um, the core structure, uh, so this is, uh, the, is, is basically we've got these, uh, I've got these things that we'll do every week called um, muddiest points. And these things are graded for completion, not correctness. Uh, so they're 5% uh, of your, uh, your grade. And basically, every week, uh, I'll have to check the due date on Canvas when I said this is, but I think it's every Sunday night these are due. And they basically ask you three questions. And uh, so the Canvas assignment will say, uh, what were topics this week that were clearest to you? What were topics that were muddiest to you? Now, I'm not, now a lot of students will say, well, you know, I understood everything this week, so nothing was muddy. So that's why I say muddiest. So if you could list a topic that even though you might have understood it, you'd say that maybe it was, it was the closest to the margins of not understanding, <coughs> then you know, give me that. And then is there a topic that you'd like to learn more about? You have to write a lot in these things. Um, I'm not gonna grade a lot of them in detail, but I do go over them and it gives me an idea of kind of where people are sitting, what's being interesting, what's coming across, and what's not. And I do think that pedagogically it actually helps for you to reflect upon what you've done that week. So that's what, what those are about. And then I'll uh, occasionally put some homework activities, and these will be relative, these will be kind of short assignments that will either ask you conceptual questions about the content or ask you to do a basic implementation. So do a, um, let's try a genetic algorithm, but we're gonna use a base 10 encoding of a genetic algorithm to solve a simple optimization problem. Can you do that by hand? That sort of thing. And so um, the, these homework assignments will pop up. There's probably gonna be maybe say six or seven of them. Um, I might, because I, again, I, when I taught this with a smaller group, I had a couple of these assignments were larger uh, and they were, not only, which I think would be fine, but they, they took a little more time to grade. And, um, and you know, Sitsi does an interesting thing, and we can kind of talk about the game theory behind this, but, um, but so when you hit a 50 student threshold, um, you get a 10 hour TA or greater. Um, if you're under that 50 student threshold, then they say that there's not enough tuition dollars for your course to justify you getting a grader. Um, so it's actually better for all of your grad students to coordinate and try to, uh, to get, to have the, the courses you're interested in to have them hit this 50 student threshold. If there's, and then what's great about that is that it will create a bimodal distribution of courses that are above 50 and courses that are very small, have low numbers of enrollment. The low numbers of enrollment make it easier for an instructor to manage and the high, uh, you know, the above 50, they give you the graders, which not only makes the course you know, better for you because you get extra attention, but given that you're grad students and you're looking for TAs, then that helps actually increase the number of TAs available. So uh, the way they've done it is if they create a bunch of say, you know, 500 level courses like this that have say 42 enrollment, something like that, which is about what people in this class, then it ends up being bad for everybody. <laughs> you know? so, so that's something to keep in mind, is that in the future, coordinate with your peers to try to take <laughs> courses together so you hit this. And that, will, that will increase the number of TAs and that will increase the instructional support available for you. So just a trick. Um, and if you're, and, it, and it's, it's actually kind of curious how this works, but with ASU Online, the threshold is not 50, it's 40, and that's because students pay more tuition to, for ASU online. So it's all kind of driven by these tuition dollars. So, but because of that, because you guys are sitting in this like magical, like donut hole, um, then it makes me have to be a little more creative this semester. And I really, I really enjoy the enthusiasm for the course, um, but I may have to be more creative in the homeworks uh, just because I, I have to do these all night. Um, then, uh, and so likewise in the past, 
in the past, I was able to make more intensive homeworks to make sure that everybody was, was uh, really getting in deep with things. But now if I make a little lighter homeworks or lighter assignments online, I need some other way to assess that everybody's keeping up. So I added a, um, a midterm, but this is not going to be uh, a, light, a theory midterm. This will probably be a midterm I grade on Scantron, for example. Um, now, if you've taken any of my undergraduate courses on Scantron, and most people say my Scantron is just good or Scantron doesn't mean they're easy. Um, but they, um, I mean, the first Scantron test I ever gave in engineering, I think the average was like 50%. Now, now, the last <laughs> semester, it was like an 82. So I've gotten better at this. But, um, but, uh, but I'll probably then give, so the plan is to give a midterm and then also a final exam similar to that. But then the last obligation um, that is really kind of the, the important thing is about midway through the semester, you guys will have seen several algorithms, you'll have heard about algorithms we're going to talk about in the future, and, uh, and you will then um, choose in to do a final project on either an algorithm that is nature inspired but is not covered in this class or is an extension, a significant extension of an algorithm that was covered in the class. And I want these projects to be done in, um, in teams. And for a graduate level course like this, I think I can manage teams of two because uh, uh, otherwise it, it gets a little watered down. But it just would be difficult for me to have everybody do an individual project. And I think teams of two are good because you can work from each other. Um, so these are two person. And this will be divided up among, uh, you'll, you know, about mid-semester. And the dates will be on Canvas. Uh, you'll form your teams. And so that's just like a little Canvas assignment where, you all, where everybody puts down an individual assignment who's going to be in my team. And then uh, shortly after that, there will be a proposal where in one page you say, um, this is the project that we want to do together. And this, so this is basically the algorithm that we would like to do. And this is why uh, we think it's relevant to the course. Um, and, uh, and then the, the, the purpose of this project will be to demonstrate that you understand the algorithm and then build a cool demo that will show the algorithm working. And so um, let's say you want to, I've had people do kind of cool things that have to do with like, I want to you know, do an optimization problem that actually produces a piece of computer generated artwork that is closest to a Picasso or something like that. And I'm going to use a cellular automaton model to do that. You know, those are the types of things that um, are not, um, if you keep the, the kind of the scope of the inputs of that, like exactly what you're trying to match, small, it's not that difficult to implement, but it has enough intellectual depth to be kind of warrant this type of project. And then, um, and then you'll end up doing a presentation. And uh, that is, um, so I'm sorry, the proposal is for, Oh, I'm sorry, this is, the, this is what I call the algorithm choice, and this is all in the syllabus, and that's with the 4%. Um, and then that is just going to be a Canvas assignment where you basically say, we're doing this algorithm, and then I check that off, and I want to make sure everybody's not doing all the same algorithm. And then your proposal will be uh, that one-page document where you tell me about your demo that you're planning on doing. And then you'll end up giving a presentation, and, uh, and then you'll end up doing a peer review of one of the other presentations, and then of a report. And that report is just a four-page report, preferably in an IEEE transaction style, but um, I'm not a stickler for format, so it could be other things. And there are details on this on, on Canvas and in the syllabus. Now, most likely what we're going to do with the presentation is that because there's so many of you, we just wouldn't have a, it would be a real bore to have to go through you know, 20 groups all in class presentations. So I've tried this with another course and it worked out pretty well. Um, what I'm probably gonna have you do is upload video presentations to Canvas and then your peer review will be randomly assigned so you'll actually watch someone else's video presentation at home. And then you'll submit your peer review from the comfort of home and uh, then submit your report. So you're gonna be doing the project and someone else from the class, or actually several people from the class, so individuals, we randomly assign groups, 
will view the presentation, but that way we don't all have to spend two or two and a half weeks just doing presentations. So that's kind of the outline there. Um, so are there questions about the structure of the course and how things will run? Yeah. So you said Scanton format for midterm and final? That's the plan. Yeah. So then, but it still will also be um, similar to like the Five Seventy Five style of Scanton. Um, it would be four seventy five. Four seventy five. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so again, this is a new component. So I haven't written a you know exams for this course before. But the idea is that uh, I will ask sort of conceptual questions about you know what is an elite in a genetic algorithm? Why do we have elites? Uh, those sorts of things. And so just making sure that, I mean, the, ba the basic purpose, and this is a survey course, so what you're going to do is when you come out of this course, if you ever go into a job or you're working on a research project and somebody says, oh, I've got this very complicated optimization problem, should I use an ant colony optimization or a genetic algorithm or a particle swarm? And I want you to sort of be fluent enough that you could say that, well, you know what, this actually seems like something we should use a particle swarm optimization for. Um, you know, so I, I but then if somebody were to ask you, what are all the details, I want you to be able to give a high level outline of how a particle swarm optimization algorithm would work. But even though I might ask you to build you know, tiny versions of these throughout the course, when it actually comes out of the exam, um, I'm not necessarily looking for that level of understanding. I want you to recognize what these algorithms are, roughly how they work, and be able to choose them in the future and understand, see potential pitfalls. Yeah. So are you thinking of giving the final exam uh, the current plan is during finals week. Um, there's this funny rule that we actually have to do something <coughs> during finals week, even though a lot of people don't. Um, but um, because I used to do presentations during the um, during the, the regular period, and now I'm doing them online, there is a little bit of slack at the end of the semester, and so I'm trying to come up with a more creative scheduling here. I should know this for the next couple weeks exactly how things will unroll. Um, I'm sure everybody would like me to get these out, out of the way before finals week. Yeah. And so, um, so we might be able to do something like, for example, um, have the final exam the last week of courses and have your peer reviews due during finals week or something like that. Question? Uh, what does this kind of Oh, um, it's like a, a, something called a bubble sheet. And so it's a you know, pencil. So you have your, basically it's a, a multiple choice test that's graded uh, a, kind of like a computer vision. Um, I, well, I, I guess the GRE is on a computer, but this is actually on paper. So okay. you know, we've never used a Scantron. These are the things that it's a you know a piece of paper that has five bubbles, um, A through E, and you have to fill in one, and you've got like 30 of them here. So it basically is like a multiple choice test that then I can send over to a, a special uh, office on campus, and they can have like all of you graded, and I don't have to worry. So both the midterm and the final would be scanned. That's my plan. Um, now, again, so when at multiple choice, like, just my, like I might still ask you to do something. Like, let's say I was asking you to, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to do this, but take a complicated derivative or something like that. Um, my, the answer that I ask you for might be like, add up all the exponents in your answer. And, um, and then so, you know, that might be 2, 7, 15, uh, 20, and 25, or something like that. So it would be difficult to guess. Uh, but it, and it still requires you to do the math, but it allows me to collect an answer. That, so that's the idea there. So I still might ask you quantitative things, not just conceptual things, but for the purposes of making sure that I can get things graded quickly, I'll, I'll ask in a multiple choice format that can be auto graded. Yeah. Two questions. Uh, so is your presentation like, so what's the duration of the presentation? Oh, sorry, good question. So this is, uh, I think I, in the syllabus, I have it set at 12 minutes. Also, like, is the report submission, is that individual? Is that an individual task? Oh, or this, uh, the only thing, all of these are group, but this formation is an individual assignment. And basically, I'm just making sure that um, every team member agrees on who the other team is. So is it like the person is just like 12 minutes for the group? or Some minutes for the group. Some minutes. So basically, uh, because I'm probably going to do this as a video presentation, then um, and I've got stuff, if you've never you know, had to record a video presentation, I've got stuff online on how to do that on the Windows and the Mac. So 
but basically the two of you can go through the presentation. Um, you don't even have to videotape yourself. You could just record audio on top of the slide presentation. And then it should just be something that I and your peer reviewer can then play on Canvas <coughs> to evaluate. And there will be a standardized rubric for the peer review. And then, uh, so I will be grading whether you um, gave thoughtful comments along with the standardized rubric. And then that's how you do a peer review for it. Other questions? Okay. Um, all right, so any other official stuff? Um, so they do stress that I'm supposed to remind, uh, so that the, so most of the, the stuff in the syllabus are your standard rules on academic integrity and things, and um, I assume you'll read through that. Um, they have recently started stressing that uh, for, these, for Title IX, for basically harassment, sexual discrimination, to remind you that all ASU instructors are considered mandated reporters, which means if you were to come to me to report that something happened, then I would be mandated to then report that um, higher up. Um, and so and that's, that's fine if you want to do that, but I'm just supposed to remind you that if that ever comes up, I have to report it. So um, then, it's all of the administrative stuff. The tentative schedule, uh, which we've got on the back page, the last page of the syllabus, is basically we're gonna start with uh, genetic algorithms, GAs, and then we're going to move to related topics that I'm calling beyond the GAs, um, and that is genetic programming and artificial immune systems. Now there is a course offered at this exact same time by Stephanie Forrest um, in Artisan Commons, and she and I are looking for ways in which we can synergize where some of her students uh, might come in and we'll come there. We'll have to see which room's big enough, but, uh, but where we might do um, a couple of, of lectures that overlap between the two courses, because if you're not familiar with Dr. <coughs> Forrest, she is an expert in the artificial immune systems and security applications. She's sort of one of the first ones to come up with some of the algorithms that we'll actually talk about here, and I actually would teach about them in this course before she was hired here, and so then um, she got hired here and started teaching her course, and was a little worried it was just gonna be a copy of this one, but it turns out that we only overlap on a couple of things. And so uh, that's kind of the next thing. And then multi-objective genetic algorithms, uh, then uh, distributed genetic algorithms and multimodal optimization. Um, and then we'll switch. So this is all the kind of evolutionary algorithms and, uh, and genetic. And then we switch into simulated annealing, which is another nature-inspired algorithm that has nothing to do with biology. Um, but it's good to compare because it works so darn well and it's often used as a benchmark for these. And, uh, and then we'll switch over to kind of the swarm intelligence. And so I'll call this swarm int. Where that's where we see things like ant colony optimization, uh, bacterial foraging optimization, particle swarm optimization, et cetera. And, um, and then that will allow us to then move into multi-agent systems and parallel distributed numerical processing. And uh, then um, a lot of you are going to have a lot of familiarity, especially the computer science side of things with artificial neural nets. Um, but uh, I am going to sort of, uh, we'll have at least a lecture where we're kind of going to go over the basics of where ANNs came from and, uh, and, you know, and what does it mean to be deep and why is it useful to be deep or is it useful to be deep? Um, and, then, uh, and then how do you combine ANNs with some of these evolutionary methods as alternatives to things like uh, you know, using a gradient, so back propagation and things like that that you might be already familiar with. Um, and how these might be useful for more complicated topologies like reservoir computing and things like that. And then we'll talk about cellular, automa or cellular automata and uh, evolutionary connections there. And, um, and then the current plan is then to um, end talking about uh, stochastic policies in distributed uh, multi-agent systems. 
Um, and so, uh, and I'll have several sort of stochastic robotics and stochastic self-assembly. So some of you are I think, uh, in the robotics and automation systems program, and so it, you know, this should immediately resonate with that, but throughout here, like the multi-agent systems, what I want you to be doing is be thinking about um, how would some of these algorithms look like if they were physically embodied? Because a lot of the, the I mean, there's this genetic algorithm stuff, like people trump up the genetic part of it, but really what's exciting here is gonna be that they're population-based. And so it's this idea of I've got multiple agents moving in parallel in an independent way and occasionally getting back together and sharing information. And so that is something you could imagine in a physically embodied system. And so there are some insights that we can get here um, when we think about these in automation systems as well. So that's the basic outline. So any questions about where we're going? Or any other policy stuff? Yeah. Do we have dates yet for the exams or for midterms? Um, not, uh, yeah, let me look at how these things are gonna be okay. spread out. But I anticipate this will be, you know, in the neighborhood of, uh, of you know, mid-semester spring break, maybe the week after spring break. Okay. Oh, I haven't set my office hours yet. I'm waiting for some other puzzle pieces and another sheet, but that'll be the second shoes drop. So, but then, but uh, the, there is a page on Canvas, instructional staff and office hours, where I'll post that. Yeah. Are the, are the exams open book or can you also order an exam? Um, if you want, I can give you like a, a, a sheet to double-sided <coughs> notes. We can do that. Anything else? All right, so this term um, is gonna come up a lot this semester, and I'm just interested in seeing what it means to you. So the term I'm looking for here is metaheuristic. What is a meta heuristic? Yeah, in the back. Can you use uh, black ink? Black ink. I can sure uh, give that a shot. I am also doing my best to record the lectures and post the videos after. So apparently, I cannot use black ink. Let me see. Oh, did somebody see a blue? Yeah, blue oh, that's exciting. <coughs> So sad. <laughs> I think we're stuck with red. Um, or um, let me do this. We have technology. once um, in a class where I was doing a midterm review and as I plugged the tablet in I wasn't expecting it but it switched to a different pad on my note-taking app and suddenly all of the solutions for the midterm were posted and it was video recorded I had to edit the video so yeah Thing is, I don't think it would have caught on if I didn't said anything. So it's my. <laughs> All right, let's see if this works. Laptop. Or is this the dock cam? All right, so, oh, but I'm still red. <laughs> I 
Is that better? No. Great. So, metacuristic. What does this term mean? Does anybody have a guess? Have you ever heard of this term? How many people have at least heard this term? All right, that's okay, that's okay, great. How about heuristic? Just get rid of the meta. What is, does anybody have a guess of what this term is all about? Yeah, what's the name of the Right, so the question, so there was, um, the, I think the, it was a rephrase, is, is it's sort of a, a rule that, um, that you choose that has, that appears to do a good job at some particular task. And so, it's so heuristic, if we're to think about, you know, uh, optimization, so an optimization here, We often think about these functions, and these functions have particular shapes. <coughs> and ideally, let's say we're doing, we're trying to minimize. And so this is maybe where we want to be. That's the, the lowest particular point. But um, there might be some heuristic that we use that tends to sometimes get us to the lowest point, but occasionally will, um, will give us a point which seems okay locally, even though maybe it's not the very best. And so we talk about like greedy algorithms, for example, are algorithms that take the approach where I'm going to do what is locally best in a short time, even though maybe a more a longer term planning would tell me that if I would do some other things that maybe don't look so great in the short term, in the long term when you add everything up together, I'd actually do better off. So you can come up with these heuristics that might just say, you know, measure my local benefits and just work off of those. And so um, heuristics uh, are, you can think of them as, these are kind of, I'm just gonna call these you know, local, um, normally, well, I'd say, I'll call them local optimizers. And I'll put quotes around optimizers because there's no guarantee that they give you optimal solutions. And meta heuristics provide you ways in which you can find those local optimizers. And so we are going to start talking about one of the most famous meta heuristics, the genetic algorithm. And a genetic algorithm, or a GA, <coughs> Uh, we view as a meta heuristic in that it is, you know, ultimately looking for this X star. And it uses some, uh, some fancy dynamics in the way in which it explores this space to try to find this X star. But there's no guarantee that it'll find this X star. Sometimes it'll find this other thing. Sometimes it'll find this other thing. Um, so it, in, and if you, depending if this is like a multi-dimensional space, your genetic algorithm um, isn't actually revealing to you anything that's like fundamental about your, your system. It's just sort of finding <coughs> local regions that look like they're pretty good. In fact, because the genetic algorithm doesn't use any gradient information, it might not even get down to the bottom here. It may return to you solutions that are, you know, that are just around this point up here. So that's why sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between a heuristic and a meta heuristic. But the reason we kind of think of the genetic algorithm as a meta heuristic is that it's uh, it's it's sort of choosing solutions that even in this this local basin here aren't even at the bottom of the basin, but it helps you find things that are good enough. So the heuristic is sort of something that is good enough, although not the best. And the meta heuristic is a tool that helps you find the heuristic. And the next big thing after that are these so-called new class of hyper heuristics. And as we'll see, a genetic algorithm itself has parameters. And then the question is, my genetic algorithm is looking for the optimal x, but it has certain parameters. Well, how do I find the best parameters of the genetic algorithm? 
Well, you can wrap an additional optimizer around the genetic algorithm, and the marriage of the two optimizers, this hierarchy of optimizers with you, is a hyperheuristic. And so it is optimizing the metaheuristic, which is looking for the heuristic. Now, if you know the, the people who do mathematical optimization, um, you know, linear programming and all that, hate this stuff because it just adds more and more uncertainty that you're ever going to actually hit the true point here. But what's the answer to that? Like, why do we bother with these crazy metaheuristics, even though we might end up at a point that's not even at a local optima? Why do we, why do we, why would we use these tools? Yeah. Because the state space or the search space can be just enormous and it might be inefficient to actually find the true optima. Exactly, right. So basically the answer there was that maybe the, maybe the space, your, your, the, the configuration space of the, of what, what, of your problem is just so complicated that you have no other choice. So, uh, of course, it would be great if your optimization function you know, looked like this. And if you knew it looked like that everywhere, if it was just globally convex. We know how to solve that, you know? And, and, it, and if it's analytic as well, so there can be, you know, these things are globally convex, but we don't know the formula for. Uh, but they're, but still, if you don't know the formula for, but you at least know how to evaluate them, you can then make steps that you can kind of guarantee will eventually end up at this bottom point here. But when you start talking about these crazy systems that are either complex or very costly to evaluate, then sometimes you're stuck not being able to do just the math. So, um, you know, a, a neural network, you know. So, um, how many people here uh, do uh, deep neural network work? Okay. So, how many, if you haven't built off the top of your head, how many parameters were in the last model that you built? Okay, for, for 10, for a neural, now if you were doing like a, a deep neural network analyzing, you know, a huge data set, imagine how many parameters, like I didn't say parameters, how many say weights are in your neural network? Oh, okay, no, yes. weights, you're yes. talking number right. of weights and everything that yes. are connected, so thousands. Thousands. Like hundreds right. of thousands. Right. Yeah. Millions, exactly, thousands, millions, right. So choosing a neural network, like effectively, you know, on some hand, we, we just say, ah, oh, neural networks, they're just you know, nonlinear regression. And when you say it like that, then it makes you think that it's, you know, it's just some, some function that you know, might look like, you know, I mean, this is a nonlinear, but might look something like that. And you think, okay, so I'm just fitting coefficients. But in a neural network, you've got you know, potentially millions of these coefficients. And so you just can't really think about this thing as a mathematical entity. And so fortunately, gradient, uh, you know, gradient approaches happen to seem to do okay. But we have no idea why they do okay. And there could be other reasons why they do, uh, other things that could do a better job at finding these parameters. And so at the point where you've got uh, not just a single x that you're, but you've got millions of these parameters that you're trying to optimize to find the best fit to a huge data set, um, and a, a huge data set that in order to prevent overfitting, you end up you know, doing, you know, you take your data set and you rotate it a bunch and then you rotate it a bunch and do other things just to do the data science of preventing the overfitting, then it just makes this thing even more and more complicated. And so that's the reason why um, that although the People that are like, they, they bleed optimization, they hate this word, <laughs> metaheuristic, and they may gag a little bit when they see the image if you go to Canvas where I've got the little genetic algorithm cartoon. Um, in the end, for these types of problems, their methods just, they just don't work. You know, they, they, so that's the reason why we have to resort to that. But then we have to ask, why a GA? Why not a particle swarm, et cetera? Those sorts of things. Are there questions about that? Yeah, in the back. Um, so, they need to, so this is to verify, when you say metaheuristic, it is a way to define the heuristic? Yeah, I would say that the, that the little circle here is the heuristic, and the metaheuristic is finding the heuristic. So the GA is the metaheuristic, and the solution here um, is kind of a heuristic solution because it's not necessarily an optimal solution. Yeah. So how exactly is GA different from 
Well, so um, you can use a GA to solve a nonlinear regression. And so, but, so like a nonlinear regression is basically just, I, I've got a data set, you know, and a set of responses. So I've got independent variables and, you know, and, and dependent you know, response variables, and I'm just trying to find these coefficients. And to find these coefficients, there's a number of different things you can do. And the GA, in that case, wouldn't be crawling X, it would be crawling outside data. So it is just doing the fitting for you. That what I mentioned so uh, very costly. So um, in some ways, this meta heuristic stuff almost gets into a design of experiment space as well. Because what if your optimization objective isn't necessarily high order? It might be, you know, or it might have a high order um, uh, input here, but it might be really, really costly to evaluate. Like let's say every test, uh, I have to run a, a, a real world experiment that costs $25,000 to run. So then what do I do? You know, if I, uh, if I can't, you know, if I can't, you know, do sort of a search where I'm trying to kind of figure out how curved the space is and things like that, then how do I run a very few number of evaluations and still end up doing pretty well? And so maybe we can build meta heuristics and do that. Yeah. So then is simulation that you're used for determining heuristics? Well, I, I guess simulation and this stuff is going to go um, hand in hand together because a lot of the meta heuristics that we'll talk about, like simulated annealing, can be viewed as a simulation of a process, and that process happens to settle down into these troughs. So I could simulate the way in which um, a fluid uh, cools into a solid, and that solid might have certain properties which from an optimization perspective are interesting. So if I design my expression of the fluid just right and then run my simulation, then the solid that I simulate, you know, kind of, I don't know, coming out of that process ends up maybe being a solution I'm looking for. Other questions or comments? Yeah. So in simulating that heuristic that it doesn't make a prime thing too far, is it kind of narrowing down the range that you're seeing? Well, so what we'll see is in a hyper heuristic is just, it's not narrow, it, it doesn't affect, well, so what we'll find is we'll say, okay, if I configure it, let's say, so we'll learn that a genetic algorithm has a certain number of, um, of members of the population. The population is a certain size. But we don't know how big that population should be. For some optimization objectives, say this one here, we might want a um, hundred little individuals running around the space. But for another type of optimization objective, we might only want 10. So which do we choose? So a hyperheuristic may use some other information about the objective to then set the parameters of the metaheuristic. So a hyperheuristic says, oh, I see that I took a couple of, um, of snapshots of your optimization objective, and it doesn't change that much over this range, so I am going to set the genetic algorithm to be this other thing. So if, if one way you could think of it is the hyperheuristic could just be a course optimizer that then um, you know, gets you roughly in the right neighborhood and then passes it off, almost like a decision tree, to a, um, a more fine-grained optimizer that's tuned for that local space that you found. Yeah, Ruben? So uh, they, they could. So chemical reaction networks we'll talk about um, in the last kind of unit where we talk about stochastics and multi-agent systems. And so um, a chemical reaction network, a CRN, if I were to have a bunch of embodied agents that run, are running around, so this is a chem reaction network, if I have a bunch of agents, let's say they're robots or they could be virtual agents, and they're moving around, possibly um, colliding into each other, and every time they collide, they change, they maybe share information, they change their behavior. Um, these sort of things we can model like chemical reactions. We can sort of say that if this is an entity of species um, X and this other one's of species Y, then we know that X and Y interact at a particular rate, and when they do, um, then they become um, new species A and B that might behave in different ways. Maybe these ones are fast, 
and these ones are slow. Maybe X uh, always curves to the right, Y curves to the left. Maybe A and B are still, they keep their, their handedness, but they change their speed. Now, if you have a bunch of these things together, then you might ask, um, what's the equilibrium uh, distribution of these things? So what, you know, if I let this thing run over time and then I took a random sampling of these agents, then what would be the distribution of X, Y's, A's, and B's? And if you design your chemical reaction network in a useful way, then that solution may actually be related to the outside environment. So let's say I want to measure the size of a space, and I don't know that size of the space. Um, I might want to design a chemical reaction network so that as these things bounce around the space, then their demographics allow me to read out the size of the space without them actually doing any computations locally. So I've exported the computations to the network itself, as opposed to having a robot maybe running around and dead reckoning and keeping track of how many steps it, it uh, fell, uh, followed and fell into the wall and so on. So you could think of these as heuristics when you're thinking of, um, or as meta heuristics. I, well, so I, I would say the CRN is a, a CRN solution to like, you know, estimating volume would be a heuristic for estimating volume. Most of the time, it probably gets within you know, 5% of the right volume, but you have no guarantee of that. But choosing the parameters here, uh, maybe I would use a GA to do that. Yeah, going back to uh, hybrid heuristic, uh, wouldn't like adding additional parameter will make the solution better? Like it, it will always do, right? Well, that's, so the, um, if you're talking about like a, an artificial neural network, if you add an additional you know, layer, you're adding more degrees of freedom to your regression, and so you're kind of you know, getting closer and closer to overfitting your data, and so you're going to get an, you know, an increase uh, in, in the match of your ANN. But we're talking, talking about like, if you're optimizing that ANN, um, I'm not necessarily talking about adding a parameter, but changing the parameters. And so, like the, you know, we haven't talked about it, does that make sense, what I'm getting at there? Yeah. Um, is the hyper meta heuristic designed for uh, meta heuristic specific to the longer term user, or can we use the same hyper meta heuristic in different kinds of meta heuristic? I mean, I think there are hyper heuristic approaches that are tailored for certain meta heuristics, for sure. Um, but then there are also um, a lot of people just generically wrap a simpler optimizer around their, like they say, okay, I'm gonna let the GA run for so many generations, and I'm gonna see how good it, how well it did. And then I uh, just pipe that into, I don't know, it could even be uh, a gradient you know, approach, it could be like Newton's method or something like that. So wrapping Newton's method around uh, a genetic algorithm may be a fine uh, hyper heuristic and a strategy that you could use with particle swarm optimization as well. Yeah. Do they always or mostly just rely on the objective function, like the objective function that you saw in the general study to make? Well, I mean, th this is so. Th this idea of hyper heuristics is a very broad idea, and it's just generally um, anything that. So I would say that if we're you know focusing on this hyper heuristic idea, I would say that it's it's any kind of higher level um, optimize, uh, optimization algorithm that is optimizing another optimization algorithm that is optimizing some function. And so there may be links from the function that are indirect or direct here. I mean, ultimately, this optimizer is going to try to find parameters of this optimization algorithm that improve solutions. So those solutions have to come from this objective function. But whether this optimizer has direct access to this or not, th that there, you can have hyper heuristics that do both. That they actually put their toe into this water or hyper heuristics that indirectly look at this guy in order to figure out um, how to make this better. So you fix a number of parameters initially and then your hyper heuristic will decide which parameters are to be picked? Uh, Sure, that would be one way to do it, or the number of parameters could be itself a hyperparameter. So there are parameters here, 
and then those we usually think of as fixed. Um, but uh, and we just guess these using our own sort of just mental models. And so this is trying to get rid of those mental models where you say, okay, I'm not going to fix them. I'm actually going to use a different optimization algorithm here to set those parameters. And it itself might have some parameters, um, but they might be a fewer, a lesser set of parameters. Um, so, this, so this is where I'm getting confused. Like, I mean, wouldn't they keep on, like, if you keep on adding parameters, your solution will keep on getting better, right? So you're, unless you have some penalty for adding more parameters. Right, well, and usually this whole thing is like subject to some computation budget or something like that. <coughs> and so given that this thing can only run for so many cycles, then, um, then we're going to how we're going to do a pilot study where maybe we run it ten times and see how often it gets close to the optimizer, and then we're going to go up and we're going to change some parameter and do that again. And this might just be in the pilot stage, and once you come up with some good parameters, you get rid of that thing, and then you just run this one on the bigger one. So, but I don't want to dwell too much on that. But I at least want to say that these are terms that you're going to see a lot in um, throughout the uh, the hyper heuristic. I'm not going to, we're not going to see directly a lot, but as we start introducing parameters of the meta heuristics, I want you to know that you, there's going to be a lot of these questions. Well, how do I choose that? How do I know how many niches do I need here? Or how many number of agents do I need here? And in some cases, I can tell you, well, you know, it depends. And it depends in a way that is not clear. And there are ways in which you can take even simpler optimization algorithms and use them to try to set those parameters. But the basic hierarchy is you get hyperheuristic and then metaheuristic. And then a term we won't see much uh, is just basically heuristic. But this course focuses much on where these metaheuristics come from, like GAs, PSOs, ACO, et cetera. All right. Any other questions? Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, we will uh, we'll talk about that a little bit, but then I usually don't talk too much just in case people want to use that as their final project. But um, there's um, if for those interested in the combination of neural networks and evolutionary algorithms, I, I recommend you take a look at least at first at this framework called NEAT, which is like neuroevolution of augmenting topologies or something like that. And so NEAT um, is one of the many attempts where the neural network is actually choosing the, I'm sorry, the, the, the genetic algorithm is actually choosing the topology of the neural network. And so you've got, you're optimizing not just the weights, but actually the structure of the neural network. So that, that's a pretty frequent. But there's other frameworks as well. This is just a particularly popular one. Any other questions about this? Yeah. Uh, what if we keep on increasing the hierarchy and adding uh, optimization algorithm just because at a lower level there are many parameters? I mean, you, you can. Uh, I mean, usually when you go from metaheuristic to hyperheuristic, you've gone from like, five parameters you don't really understand, the one parameter you pretty much have a handle on, and there's no reason to go more than that. So I guess you could, you know, turtle it all the way down, but eventually the madness has to stop. <laughs> you just have to get work done. Turtles yeah. all the way down? Just letting you know that the, the look it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, how are we doing on time here? That was very animated, I appreciate that. All right, so, um, the, so basically what we're going to be starting talking about, um, starting on next time, are broadly the class of evolutionary algorithms. <coughs> and the GA is just one example of these, but is not the only one. It's just the one that has kind of become very dominant and popular. Um, but basically, an evolutionary algorithm is going to have um, the, the big flavor of an evolutionary algorithm is, is that you instantiate a, um, well, so does anybody understand what I mean by like an optimization objective that, that would be difficult to solve? So I, I have some function and this f function could be a mathematical function 
or it could be uh, the outcome of an experiment, of a real physical experiment. And so, uh, you know, every time I run it, I've got, you know, fx1 gives me one answer, fx2 gives me another answer, and so on, all the way up to fxn. So these are, you know, n samples of f. And the goal is to find the parameters. So this x could be a vector here, a very high dimensional vector. Um, that, and when we get into multi objective, this f can also be a vector. So, but right now it's a scalar. And so uh, we're, you know, we're looking for potentially a very high dimensional kind of set of parameters that is kind of the best sample that we can find. And we're pretty confident there's no use to go on sampling anymore. And so these evolutionary algorithms, their big insight is that maybe we can do parallel searches rather than a purely sequential search. So there's local search algorithms which start at one of these, like x1, and they just look around there and they just move around. And actually some of the first genetic algorithms um, were of this sort. So it's sort of weird to think about a genetic algorithm not having a population, but we'll get into what those algorithms look like and how they're justified as being even called genetic algorithms. But the idea is, well, what if I could start with several individuals doing their own local search and then periodically have them intermix and breed and hopefully come up with new optimizers that are somehow in between. So you're basically going to initialize a population of samplers or of samples, I guess. That's really all they are, is samples and uh, evaluate their relative success. And so in the genetic, uh, it might be viewed as relative fitness. And then based on that relative success, uh, you'll uh, keep some, and those are the elites, and you'll blend others together and that basically you can think of as an interpolation. And then you'll uh, remove others entirely. And that process will then keep going around. And that's the basic path of all evolutionary algorithms. And what makes a genetic algorithm a genetic algorithm is how it defines relative success and how it does this blending. And, um, and so I, there's and this remove others um, you know, this is possibly and create others. This is where you get things like mutation and things like that to come into genetic algorithms as well. But there's a wide range of algorithms that have this loop that aren't necessarily genetic. Question? What do you mean by blend others together? Okay, yes. That's it. So uh, the, the simplest conceptualization of this I can think of is an interpolation. And so the idea is if I've got some optimization objective, here, F, and, um, and let's say that, you know, if I'm om omniscient, I know that it looks like this, but all I know is that there's a point here and a point here. And so all I've done is taken these two samples. And these two samples, because in the past, let's say I took two samples that were both up here, I know that both of these samples are at least better than those two samples, so I decide to keep those around. And when I breed them and cause them to cross over, that is a numerical effect of creating offspring that are in between. And so it's like creating some new members that are in between these two. And those new members um, often will have the case, especially if you have particular functions that are well behaved, that actually end up you know, finding these local points in between. So that's what I mean by blending. So this is numerical sex. It's when you combine these two and then you get a blended version here. Is it yeah. blending same as keeping new members? Pardon me? Say again. Is blending same as keeping new members? Well, so creating new ones would be like, uh, so the, the, the key insight here is that I use information from both to create these two new offspring. Alternatively, I could have just taken one and do a local search around it, shifting up or down by some random amount. Or I could have just created a totally new one 
that is maybe near this one or in a totally new random spot. And so what genetic uh, algorithm, what VGA does, but not to all genetic algorithms, is that it has this recombination operator, which is able to combine two in this sort of way here. And, um, and that's one of the insights. So I'd say one of the major insights um, when people went down this genetic path is that you could use these populations to search in parallel, and that you could then um, take pairwise combinations of these to create new uh, samples in the next generations that blended aspects of the other two. So do you have that genetic function? I mean, you don't have that genetic exact function, right? So how do you like, when you blend them, what, how do you know what exactly you are exactly? The only thing you have control over is the X. And so when I say interpolate, I'm not saying interpolate in this space, but in this space. So if I know that one of my individuals in the population is here, um, I'll call this individual one, and this individual's here, individual two, and I know that individual one was slightly worse than individual two, but both were better than that, then that allows me to maybe, um, if I don't blend them together, that maybe allows me to generate more offspring just purely from this one. But um, if I do want to decide to blend those together, then I effectively do uh, like a convex combination of these two. And so that is in what ends up giving me something interpolated. But the kind of beauty of the recombination operator is that if I was just saying, well, I'm going to take a convex combination, I'm going to take an average of these two, I only get one out. But the, the recombination operator um, takes two inputs and produces two outputs. And those two outputs um, actually end up not being the midpoint, but they sort of both be kind of in the middle. And it's kind of like if I, um, you know, if I had two numbers, like if x1 was equal to, uh, I don't know, 42, and x2 was equal to 34, um, you know, a, a recombination operator ends up saying, well, I, from there, I can combine, <coughs> I can kind of split the most significant and least significant digits off and then recombine those. So in that case, my, maybe I get out of that 44 and, um, uh, so 44 and maybe I get 32 out or something like that. And so I end up getting these, in this case they went, uh, so this one got, so th th they're near, so these two are both near their, uh, their parents, but they end up using the kind of, the stresses of the other two to kind of pull them in the, in the, right, the right way. And so that's just one way to recombine is by these digits here. But a lot of times, um, you know, actually like doing the, the numerics of having to like, you know, break a number apart by its place values and things like that is often very inefficient. And so people come up with approximations for recombination, which are often just averages approaches. And so um, and we'll get into that. So that's the other thing about these genetic algorithms is that there's been a lot of effort to try to optimize how you know, how costly they are to implement mutation, recombination, et cetera. So that's a whole nother thing to add to these metajuristics, is that you're not only trying to optimize an objective function, but you're trying to come up with uh, clever tricks to optimize the way in which you, you, know, you sort of achieve the spirit of the algorithm. Because, you know, these things, even though we call it recombination, biologists, whenever you hear recombination, they think sex. Well, these aren't having sex, you know, but they're doing something that's in the spirit of sexual recombination. And there are a bunch of different ways you can implement that. You can model that numerically. And those, all of those different ways have different pros and cons. And so we'll talk about different ways to implement these operators. And uh, you'll see there's a diversity of ways you do mutation, ways you do recombination, relative fitness, et cetera. So that's kind of where we're going. Um, and we'll get into more details um, on Wednesday. But that's, I think, as far as I want to go today. Are there any other burning questions or concerns? Yes. So one thing is there's a bunch of readings as well for each unit. Is it, uh, what's the expectation for that? Right, so, um, and so this will become more clear as I, I de-blackboard and re-canvas the site, but, <laughs> um, but the, um, but there will be, basically the way, nominally, the way each, there's 10 units, and nominally each unit will have kind of a lecture component and a reading component, and so the idea would be is that I'll talk about some stuff, and then you guys will read some stuff, 
and then in most cases we'll have an opportunity to do discussion in class. And so uh, I may have to come up with more creative ways to do discussion, like break into small groups, everybody come back together, I'm working all that out, but nominally, um, then uh, about, there'll be like one reading per unit, and there's gonna be some units where there's less readings because it's just kind of basic, and there's not like, it was just kind of giving a little bit of background, so it probably won't be one reading per unit, but you know, so in the end, it might average to be like 0.75 readings per unit. But, uh, but that's kind of the, the hope, is that we do a little lecturing, a little reading, and a lot of discussion. Ruben? And how, how recommended are the other three books? Oh, well, so the books I just listed, because a lot of people just like to have references, and those references are more like after you leave here. And so those um, books that I put on the syllabus, uh, I will be drawing a lot of my insights, or I have drawn a lot of the insights and chapters in those books. So if you'd like to read more, those are good ones to go to, but uh, by no means do you need those books for the class. I'll provide all the readings on, can or on yeah, Canvas. Anything else? All right, thanks. See you guys in a couple of days.